you were saying that the Air Force was flying the B-29s off the ground, and I'd forgotten that you were flying off the water. You were a, a, a seaplane, so to speak, if we, I'm we were the not using the wrong term. Well, that's they call a flying boat, but that's all right. PB flying boat, uh, PBMs. And it was a big bomber, almost as big as the 29, but not quite. 29 was the biggest bomb, bomber we had. Now, how long had these boats, flying boats, been in service? How long had they been? Uh, I think since the 1930s. Oh, so they had been available throughout the war. Oh, throughout the war and before that. The one before, the one we flew in was a PBY, Catalina. And you, you know, it's a real picturesque airplane. And, and if you've seen the movies of Pearl Harbor, you'll see one I'm blown up and on fire. Has a real high wing. And that's so when they take off, the water doesn't get up in the engines. Has twin engines and a single tail. And, and back in the back of the PBY, there's two bubbles on each side, and there's a gunner in each bubble. And then our plane replaced that one. It has larger engines, could fly higher, fly faster, fly f longer, and carry take up more bombs. Yeah. And so they were very valuable because they didn't have to have a land base. That's right. Uh, yeah, could they land on land, or...? They could not. They did have that. We, that. we actually flew in, they call them amphibious. Yeah. They had wheels put on the side so they could land on land or water, right. whichever they wanted. On the PBY, I think some of the PBMs had them. I, I never did see one, but I heard they did. So yeah, they, what were, while we're on this topic, we'll come back to your experiences, but what were some of the other uses that they had been made for during the war? Up until the time you were in the service, what other things were they doing? Oh, they're very versatile. Um, they used them for all of the invasions. They'd fly off out of gun range, and if some of our Air Force pilots got shot down, then they would fly in to fire and try to rescue the the, um, the, the pilot that shot down. President Senior President Bush was shot down in a torpedo bomber in one of the invasions. Uh, his assignment that day, and he had, that's a small plane, just had had a gunner right behind him and then one underneath him, and uh, they dropped torpedoes, or they could carry regular bombs. He'd gone in to one of the islands to blow down the uh, radio, the communications um, station, and um, and got hit on the way out, and um, and he went down. Unfortunately, both both of his gunners drowned, but he got out somehow. And we sent a PBM, PBY at that time, in to go get him, and they got him and brought him back to the carrier. And I've seen the pictures of him getting on the carrier, walking around. Right. So they, yeah, yeah they, they could do air sea rescue, they called it, and they did all kinds of things, delivered mail, uh, hauled. Did they do some of the submarine patrols off the Atlantic, off the coast of the United States as well? Or? Um, I guess they flew off the coast. Uh, uh, they, they were all over the world, uh, lying on, off of water, all over the world, yeah. So coming back to July, August of 1945, so were you aware that the invasion was going to be as many weeks away as that, or was it? We were told that, that they didn't tell us a lot of things because they didn't want the word to leak out. But he did, as I said, um, told us, this was in summer of 45, and we were, getting, we were ready to leave. We were all done training. We were just getting organized to leave. And he said, as I mentioned, they're going to, we're going to announce, we're going to let the word leak out the invasion on November the 1st. Right. But we don't know when it's going to be, and you're not going to be told. But <laughs> Until you're we don't want, your orders. <laughs> we don't want the word leaking out on anything. So you'll find out when you get in the sky. So after the second atom bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, what was happening on the island? I mean, how did the information get back to you, and what was the reaction? Um, oh, I don't know. What, uh, we, we hadn't left the States yet. We were in Corpus Christi. Oh, I'd forgotten. And I know we partied all night long. Oh, my. We went, we, you know, we're safe. So all the bars were open. Everything was wide open till sunrise, and we had a good time. Yeah. I was, actually, I was hoping to get to fly one mission, and lived through it, and then the war ended, but we didn't, it, uh, and we knew nothing about the atomic bomb. I mean, that was totally secret. Yes. Totally secret. So, oh, I see. So they were giving you the plans. You were going to go to San Diego on the older planes and then to the island. Aha. Uh -huh. I missed, well, I, I'm sorry, I missed the. 
Well, that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, we're, we were going to fly the older planes, 24 of them, to San Diego. Right. And the Navy air pilots, and I've seen several of those, they were going to fly new ones with bigger engines from the, directly from the factory to San Diego. And then we were going to fly the new ones to Honolulu. And then they were going to fly the older ones. They didn't fly in combat, but they did a lot of work in the country. Fly the older ones back to Corpus Christi. And uh, so, um, but uh, you know, that was, uh, we were ready to go. Yeah. So coming back, you've now recovered from the celebrations and it's <laughs> BJ Day. Right. What happens now? Uh, what, what do they do with the crews that they've trained so well? What, what did you do? We all did nothing. What do you do with a bombardier when there's nothing to bomb? You know? um, and for some reason, they did select me to be on the public address system for the Naval Air Station at Corpus Christi. I don't know exactly why, but um, so I was on the PA system, public address system, uh, from the time we quit flying until um, I received orders to go to Great Lakes. They, they were moving people out to some base closest to their home to be discharged. And they promised us we'd all be discharged within a year so we could start college the following year. Well, in September, <clears throat> and this is maybe off the subject, but uh, um, a, a hurricane approached Corpus Christi and um, from the Atlantic Ocean. And we were flying our new B uh, PB4Y2s, that's the Navy version of the B-24s, into the eye of the thing, and they were tracking it. Then they were relaying the message back to the commanding officer of our base. And then he was sending me memos, and I was um, reading the memos to the personnel on the base. And um, it really was a total surprise to all of us. He said, uh, it said that if the hurricane stays on its current path, the eye will hit us about midnight. Uh, and this was the middle of the afternoon, and the winds were picking up a little bit. He said, everybody go eat, I think he said supper, and then they'll give you something for breakfast, and then you're going to go back and stay in your barracks. They're built to withstand hurricanes along the coastlines. And, and the, if the eye does hit us, it's going to be real quiet for 15 or 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. Then all of a sudden the wind will hit you coming from the opposite direction. And no one... Go out, is allowed to go outside. There'll be power lines down, we'll lose the intercom, we'll lose telephones, we'll lose everything. And that's exactly what happened. Oh, it did hit. It did hit, and it hit about midnight, the eye did. And then he said, they'll, we'll sound the siren when they all clear, when the, at a daybreak, we'll have, like, we'll have personnel out getting the electric lines picked up, and then um, you can go to breakfast and go to lunch, but uh, stay in the barracks until you hear the siren. No. And, we, and we all lived through it. Were there planes at the base as well? That's a good question. Um, we had uh, we had the flying boats uh, I was that I was in. We also had land planes, and uh, I guess it's unfortunately, but all the land planes flew to Chanute Field. Oh. And I was hoping to get a ride on one, of them, <laughs> but I, I wasn't allowed to. And all the um, flying boats went to a big lake in the northern part of Texas somewhere, but I don't remember the name of the city. So they, I, I was they, wondering they, if they, 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 could be, they could be taken out of danger, and they were, yes. They were. They'd be totally destroyed, yeah. They were all taken out, yeah. So Except, the, the base survived without any serious injuries? Or? Not a single injury. It turned out the Admiral... And the buildings were as promised. Yes, they were, yeah. Had they been... Was the base one built for World War II, or was it a, a longer-lived base? Oh, I think it was mostly all new buildings yeah. for World War II, yeah. Probably replaced old buildings. <laughs> Probably just as well but, as it had. You know. uh, they they were very sturdy and they they withstood it. They were designed for that. The admiral did did a good job. <laughs> yeah. Now, as you were uh, training, or in, as with, were you also affiliated with some of the the veterans who had gone through some of these all combat of, missions and give give you some experiences? All of our instructors had been to combat, and so we believed them. You know, and. Uh, and um, like they told us a lot of the details, um, special training on what to do if we're, well, for example, if you're going to be flying at 25,000 feet on a different kind of a mission um, and you get shot down, don't open your parachute till you're down to about 10,000 feet. 
if you open your chute at 25,000 and inhale, it'll freeze your lungs and you're done. Um, also, some of them had been shot down, a few of them, and put in prison and escaped. We, we had gone in and, and brought them out like they did the prisoners, some of them in the Philippines. And the um, Japanese were treating the uh, flyers that were shot down terribly. Uh, all we had to give them was our name, our, uh, our rank, and, and our serial number. But the first question they said they'll ask is, now you came from where? Did you come off an aircraft carrier or off of land? We want to go destroy it. Um, and if you don't tell us, we're going to cut off your ear and that'll be your breakfast. These were the stories they told us. And, um, and we were told them, tell them anything you want to tell them just so it isn't the truth. Oh. Just so it just, you know, I came off of the Essex, it's located 3,000 yeah. miles southwest. <laughs> or I came off of the North Pole. Or <laughs> tell them whatever you want to tell them. Maybe a little more feasible than that, but still not the truth. And it's something, anything to mislead them, yeah. Right. And uh, try not to get beat up too much like... Uh, a senator from Arizona did in Vietnam. Exactly. Were there some tactics that they had to advise you that were sort of surprising? You wouldn't have thought so otherwise, or in terms of the flying and uh, combat missions and the like. No, I guess uh, um, as I said, they don't open the chute till you're down about <laughs> ten thousand. If you're out right. away from land planes, if you're over Japan and get shot down. And the zeros are up. Don't uh, open your chute till you're down to about 500 feet. Otherwise, they'll come in and strafe you. And we had no idea where we... We knew we'd be over Japan. We had no idea where. Well, they also taught us how to tell... If we got shot down at high altitude, in case they switch us to high altitude missions, and you open your chute at 10,000 feet, you had no idea which way you're gonna, where you're going to land, in China or in Japan or some other island around. They taught us how to tell the difference between the Chinese and the Japanese by how they wear their sandals. I've forgotten the details, but one of them, they put the strap between the big toe and the next toe, and the other country, they don't. And <laughs> some small things like yeah. that, yeah. But we were, we were well trained. We were, we were ready for combat. So part of the training included the survivor, if you actually parachuted and landed, how to survive on your own? And it did. Yeah, we had extensive training in that. Um, if you go down, if you get shot down, you're in the water and there's, and there's zeros in the air. Um, go down and stay down as long as you can, and then come up and get some air and then go back down. And uh, so you did inflate your life vest until after they went away, or? Um, I never did have to inflate mine, but uh, um, I was just thinking it'd be hard to go. Well, I guess I guess what they said was. When you first hit the water, go down, go down under, and then come up and look around um, and see if you see any planes in the sky. And if they don't, then open your. Right. And then if there That's are right. some, don't open it and go exactly. back down. That's what I was thinking would make sense. Right. Exactly. And they taught us how. If I don't know why they taught us this, but if um, if there's oil up on top of you uh, and it's on fire, how to make a hole and then get a breath of air and then. Keep swimming underneath it, and I don't know why they trained us that because we weren't on board ships, but uh, that was in part of our training. Yeah. Well, if, yeah, if you were attacking ships or yeah. something like that, it might occur, I suppose. Uh huh. So you were you couldn't hitch a ride to Rantoul to go to Chinook, <laughs> so you're still in Florida. Yeah. And um, they guaranteed you to be out within a year. And they how did. long was it actually? How long did it actually take? Uh, it took a year to get all of us out, and I was—I got out. They said we'll all be home by August the 20th, but following August 20th. I got out the 17th. I didn't get overseas, so I had about zero points. I think I had, what, 12, 12 points, one for each month, and that was it. Well, they sent me to Great Lakes and um, to be near the nearest Navy base to be discharged, and there was an announcement on the bulletin board one day, we need three three a aviation ordinancemen for uh, to volunteer to go to the Bikini Atoll where they tested the atomic bomb. Here I am touching my tie again. Um, and um, 
So I know they wanted somebody to go to Woodby Island up in there, Seattle first as aviation ordnance man, help with decommissioning ships. And as a equivalent to a sergeant, I was on board the, sh the ships they decommissioned with a row of rings, a, a ring of uh, keys. Let me have you back up a step. So yeah. you're at Great Lakes. They're asking for people well, to volunteer to be part of this. And you, you were there shipped out to Washington to do this? Well, I, I went to Washington first. How and did, then, what, was that, how, what did that entail for you as the ordinance person? Nothing. Uh, nothing. I just, I just had the rating of a equivalent of a sergeant. No, but I mean, while they were decommissioning, what jobs did they assign you? Or? Um, as there was hundreds of ships there, and as they were decommissioned, they would tow them into storage somewhere on the West Coast. And my job was to take from the decommissioning officer the ring of keys, and then get aboard the decommissioned ship with no power, no nothing, and they would tow it into storage. And when I got the receiving officer, he would come on board and take the keys and go down the keel and see if it's leaking. And, and that was my job. One, time, one day a week, that's all <clears> I worked. <throat> oh, so you didn't have to do any disarming or other things that ordinance people might do. Okay. No, somebody else was doing that. I see. And then they had <clears> the announcement. They wanted aviation ordinance men to go to Bikini Atoll but you, if you extend for a year, you get promoted a notch. Uh, to they're going to run an experiment. Putting they took over an island, took the people off of it, they took a lot of the older ships they wanted to get rid of, and placed them one mile, two miles, five miles out submarines, to see what effect an atomic bomb would have on ships. And uh, but I didn't want to extend for a year, so I decided to get discharged and come back to the University of Illinois. And, that's and maybe what, that was a big savings because I presume some of the people at the atoll were exposed to the radiation from the bomb. Uh, I have heard that, that some of them have eye problems and whatever. Uh, I don't know any of the details, but I've heard to like you and whatever. Yeah. Some of them were maybe didn't. Some of the observers weren't a little too close all that maybe. far away. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you're in Washington and you're discharged, or did they fly you back to Great Lakes? or? No, I got discharged in Washington and uh, got on a bus and came home. Did they pay for the bus? They paid us for our mileage, yes. Okay. Yeah, and I think they gave us $200 at the time we got discharged. If you've been overseas, $300. So we came home um, in good shape. And how did your classmates fare? Were most of them coming home at the same time? Or? Oh, all of them. Uh, uh, well, we had one, all of them, but one ahead of us stayed in. Um, well, he came out and went to law school and then went back to the, became a lawyer in the service. All of them came home from then on with no injuries. We lucked out. No, no killed, none injured. Yeah. How do you think your generation of the high school class looked back on this experience and how it affected them? Well, we have a class reunion, actually, and uh, discuss this thing. One was a paratrooper that got wounded on D-Day, the bit longest day in Europe. Another one was an invasion of an island in the Pacific, and he was wounded. Well, they don't say much about it. They just, you know, they live through it, and that's the main thing. Yeah. It is surprising to me, though. I've asked some um, high school kids, grandchildren. They really don't know much about World War II. I think you're doing a great job here. And one of them said to me, well, did we join up with Italy to fight the Russians? <laughs> so I think they, they need to have an, maybe a, an hour class sum, sum up World War II. Would be a, a, it was, it was, uh, we weren't sure we were going to win that thing in the summer of 43. Hitler had all of Europe, except England. He was making plans to take it. Um, Hirohita had all, the uh, Japanese had all the Pacific west of the Hawaiian Islands, north of New Zealand, part of China. And they had actually invaded a couple of islands in Alaska. I don't know if you've heard of that or not. Yeah, had to. And, yeah. Right. So, Plus uh, all of the Indochina Peninsula. and Exactly, yeah. So uh, we weren't sure we were going to win that thing, but uh, it, it finally worked out. One other thing that you might try to give to your grandchildren the impact of this and the GI Bill on your class. In other words, if you say went back to the class of 33 at Muhammad High School, how many of them went on to the University of Illinois versus the class of 
43 and the effect the war had on them. Do you have a feel for that? I do. I don't think any of them went to uh, college that I know of. Uh, well, I know one. But after that, I know several people. Um, when I came back to the University of Illinois and joined one of the fraternities, we had people in, in our pledge class, 16 of us from age 18 to 30, I used to say 31, and no, something I got corrected, it's 33. Oh. And they, several of them said they would never have been able to go to college uh, had, had not been for the GI Bill. And Roosevelt designed that, I guess. And his theory was that they'll earn enough much, uh, more money and pay more income taxes to more than offset the cost of going to college. And it's turned out exactly that way. Right. Turned out exactly that way. Plus, the class of 33, many of them had no way of traveling, whereas your classmates had been to Europe and Japan or the, the, yeah. and yourself. And so yeah. that gave them a different horizon. It did, yeah. Yeah, we came back home from the service, uh, loyal Americans. I've, I've always thought, and I know it's financially probably impossible, but if you could send um, all of the boys that finished high school into the service for six weeks or eight weeks and send them anywhere in the world, uh, they'll come back home much more loyal citizens. Mm. Uh, there's no way they can avoid that, uh, even... even uh, seeing England and Ireland, Scotland, Germany, and others. Yeah, it was a great experience, frankly. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience. Do you have any other thoughts that you'd like to share with us as we conclude your interview? Well, uh, not really. Uh, I think you're doing a wonderful thing. Um, and I hope they can boil it down to, say, a one-hour TV program or program in school and, and uh, somewhere in high school show them what World War II is about, and I think it'll, it'll make them appreciate what uh, everybody's been in the service since this country started have, has done for them, and uh, that's really a, not a good country, it's a great country. I think that's well put, and I thank you for your service as a, as a member of that generation. Thank it's you, It's been sir. a pleasure to talk to you. Yes, sir, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Now, don't get up until we get unhooked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>